Today we're going to talk about the Golden Ear Force Field 30 subwoofer. It's a small subwoofer that I'll be using in conjunction with the Golden Ear BRX speakers, which I reviewed a few weeks ago. Let's see how it works. This review of the Golden Ear Force Field 30 is part of our Seeking Subwoofer series. Subwoofers are an interesting beast. Uh, they can make a difference in a lot of systems. Finding a good one is hard. We're on a search for good subwoofers. And I'm pleased to say the punchline today is I think the Force Field 30 is one of those. It's relatively inexpensive, so I'm calibrating my comments to keep its $800 price point in mind. But for $800, it makes a positive difference and is relatively easy to set up. And those two things together mean I think a lot of people will be able to get value from this subwoofer. The Golden Ear Force Field 30 is, uh, I would say, fairly typical small box Woofer, we'll talk more in a moment about maybe the difference between woofers and subwoofers, but it's about a foot square on the front panel. Uh, I think it's 11 and something by 12 point something high uh, and about 16 inches deep. So it's small but not tiny. Uh, relatively easy to place in your room. My room is a little 2200 square feet and uh, I found a place for it. If you have a lot of equipment and if you have big speakers, uh, you kind of quickly get down to, there's only a few places the subwoofer can go. So having it be small is a handy thing. It's powered, so there's a Class D amplifier inside. Um, it is a ported speaker. It actually technically isn't ported, it's a ported alignment. It uses a passive radiator, which is on the bottom, so you don't see that at all. The back has the controls and the heat sinks and the connections. The front has a grill where the main 8-inch radiator plays. And on the bottom is the auxiliary base radiator which uh, supports the output of the speaker at the, around the resonant frequency for the port or the passive radiator. Speakers like this make a heck of a lot of sense. When you look at them and see how much you get, you kind of almost can't believe what a good deal it is. I like the fact that there were, was grill cloth on the bottom. It's not cloth, actually. It's a perforated metal, I believe. Um, that means when you're picking it up, you don't poke your fingers through the driver. Um, it's nicely finished. There are only a few controls on it. You have a crossover knob so you can continuously vary where the crossover point is from about 45 hertz I think to um, somewhat over 100 hertz and there is an output level knob and those are your two controls besides where you place it in the room. It can be hooked up in a number of ways uh, pretty standard I would say but it can be hooked up to the LFE port of a receiver if you're kind of using it in home theater mode. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I did not use it in that mode. It's got a left and a right RCA, female RCA jack, uh, so you can go from uh, preamp out into the sub, and it combines the left and the right signal into a mono base signal um, and that's what I did use and then there are high level connections where you can come off the speaker outputs of an amplifier when you don't have a preamp or a receiver or a device that's got a woofer output at the line level. You can use high level outputs from speaker connectors. Surprisingly I did not test that but in uh, other subwoofer situations, I've used that and it actually uh, can work surprisingly well. 
So this can be hooked up to most equipment, I would say. There could be configurations where it doesn't work, but I would say pretty, pretty flexible. So that's uh, how it works. I would like to tell you the secret sauce in here, but I'm not sure what it is. Here's what I'll say about that. Golden Ear makes a number of tower speakers that have, in their parlance, built-in subwoofers. Okay, I'll talk more in a minute why I like or don't like that idea, but I've heard a number of their tower speakers, and uh, their bass performance is very good. So Golden Ear knows something about the design and tuning of cabinets, drivers, uh, port frequencies, uh, crossover roll-offs that makes it possible to get very good bass performance quite frequently out of their products, which aren't radically expensive. So, what's the secret sauce? I think it could be a hundred little things that Golden Ear knows to do, and uh, we'll talk in a minute about whether they've done them here. Okay, the Golden Ear Force Field 30 is far, far, far from the most expensive subwoofer or woofer. I'm going to try to refer to it as a woofer because it really is, I think, primarily set up to be used with stand mount monitors or other speakers that have a tendency to roll off in the starting in the upper bass or the top part of the mid bass. So calling it a subwoofer is, I think, a little bit of a mis misnomer. Maybe you don't care, but just so we're clear, this is not a woofer that I think is optimized. You could use it for that, but it's not optimized for doing 20 to 40 hertz when you've got pretty darn full range speakers that go all the way down to 35 cycles, let's say, and are flat at 105 dB to 35. That's I, yeah, if you've got that, this speaker isn't going to help you, I don't think. But a lot of us face the situation where we've got a speaker that rolls off in somewhere in the mid-bass, and we'd like to augment that a little bit to tweak the balance of the speaker somewhat so we can bring the bass level into line with the rest of what we're hearing and have the musical presentation sound balanced. That's what this speaker is about. I think that's what most of us actually want. So I think this, I like this speaker because it fit well with the intended purpose that I think uh, a lot of people would have. The big thing I liked about it is a combination of two things. One is the bass sounded quite good, far from the best I've ever heard, but uh, more than good enough to be satisfactory, enjoyable, and make an improvement to the BRX, which if you go back and listen to my review of the BRX, I really, really, really was impressed with that speaker. And for $1,900, uh, you could spend a lot more and do no better or maybe worse. So the fact that it added to the pleasure and the accuracy of the BRX, the fact that the Force Field 30 was additive to that was an indication to me that the bass quality was quite good. The second part of what I liked about it, so sound quality in the, primarily in the mid bass, and I'll do extended dance mix on that in a second, quality in the mid bass was very good. It didn't interfere with the rest of the range of the main speakers that I was using. So you got your mid bass, you got good bass definition, electric guitars, stand up bass, piano, all sorts of low frequency instruments sounded more balanced with the Force Field 30 
in the system, but it didn't color voices or instruments that have their fundamentals in the 200, 300, 400 hertz range, which, we'll talk more about this in a bit, is a lot of instruments. So you don't want to get your bass and screw up the core of the music, which is, you know, from essentially 200 to 2000 hertz. If you screw that up, you, you, you're not getting ahead. It's, it's one step forward and two steps back. Uh, the Force Field 30 really did its bass thing and could be integrated quite nicely, combined with point number three. And point number three is that it wasn't that hard to get that level of performance. I think in total I spent about three hours playing with the positioning of the woofer to find a place where I thought it was almost always additive and almost never subtractive to the experience of the BRX. And three hours in my book is not a heck of a lot of time. If you want a set and forget thing, I, I think a subwoofer without, or a woofer without room automatic room correction DSP isn't going to work for you, and you're going to make other sacrifices if you do that. So, yeah, this is not a set and forget thing, but it's not that hard. And those of you who have turntables, setting up a turntable is easily as hard as setting up this woofer to the point where you get uh, very good sound. I did follow a path for subwoofer integration that I highly recommend, which is to have some kind of measurement equipment. If you have measurement equipment, you can see what might be wrong. It gives you educated guesses about where what you're hearing, which you don't like, let's say. I mean, because if you just put it in place and it sounds great, okay, you're done. You don't need measurement equipment. But with woofers, that almost never happens. If you have measurement equipment, you can get some guidance on, oh, I can kind of see what might not be right here. Let me try this. It doesn't tell you what to do, but it gives you hints. So I followed a series of those hints. I tried the woofer in 15 different locations, combinations of location, output setting, and crossover frequency. I think I hit the winner on uh, attempt number 12. I kept going just to see if I could do a little bit better, and I didn't do a little bit better, so I was like, okay, we're done now. And I was quite happy. I listened to a wide range of music with bass and also just vocals and orchestral music where I wanted to make sure the Force Field 30 wasn't screwing things up, and I was quite happy with the results. What I found, just as an aside, so you know what was happening for me, and I want to say very clearly, reviewing woofers is significantly a review of the room and the placement of the other speakers in the room. You know, your mileage may vary. Your mileage is highly likely to vary. So I'm giving you this information as an analogy, not to tell you what will happen for you. So what I found was when I measured just the BRX alone, I found that it was pretty solid down to 90, 100 hertz, and then it started a nice smooth roll off below that frequency. I think one of the reasons it was fairly easy to integrate the Force Field 30 with the BRX is you had a nice smooth roll off, not a lumpy, bumpy bass curve. Will you have that? I don't know. You probably aren't doing this with the BRXs, so, you know, again, your mileage may vary, but that was a nice element of what I was trying to accomplish with these two speakers together. So I had a nice smooth roll off starting at the 90, 100 hertz range. I played around quite a bit. I got to a curve that I thought was genius. It was very smooth. It fixed some of the dips in the upper bass. And I thought, oh, Tom, you are so good. This is amazing. And it's only attempt number, I think, nine. Yeah, <laughs> if only life were that easy. It was thick, the output was thick, it was heavy, it sounded unrealistic, voices were cloudy. Yeah, it was kind of a mess. And what I had done was I had just gone for perfectly flat, lower mid-range into the mid-bass, and for whatever reasons, that did not work out in 
my particular situation. It just made it way too heavy and slow and turgid. I experimented a little bit more, lowered the crosses over point, lowered the output level, and moved the woofer back so I would pick up a little bit more room gain. That gave me more output from about 110 hertz down to maybe 50 hertz. And my total gain, when you look at the curves, is output below 100 hertz gained about 10 dB. Uh, and that gave me good, solid bass. It looks like it rolls off in the curve, but uh, it was good, solid bass using the test discs that I'm accustomed to, that I've heard on many, 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 many systems. Uh, it worked out quite nicely. Uh, below 50 or 60 hertz, you just aren't going to have that much output. And so if you're, you know, an organ fanatic or really, really into uh, deep bass, if you really prize the sense that uh, super deep bass can give you of the size and space of the hall acoustic, I don't think it's going to be that easy to get it with this woofer. It's $800 and it really adds musical value in my book. So I enjoyed it a lot. I could easily use this if I were operating a system that fit with this price range. Uh, and I would highly recommend you take a listen. Okay, boys and girls, we are not done yet. I want to add a few comments to my discussion of the Golden Air Force Field 30. I think these are important because they help frame the way you might think about subwoofers. As I said, this is part of our Search for Subwoofers series, and I think these are good things to keep in mind. They aren't that specific to the Force Field 30, but they apply to the Force Field 30 because they apply to shopping for or integrating just about any woofer system. The first thing I want to recommend you think about, I'm not telling you what to do, it's your life, it's your system, you know what you want. Just suggesting you think about this, the vast majority of high-end speakers spend a large part of the designer's budget on the base system. So, what I think that means is, when you're looking at a the architecture that I had here, which is a satellite subwoofer or satellite woofer, separate woofer system, you want to make sure that you don't shortchange yourself on what you're spending, especially if you're starting from scratch and buying both the satellites and the woofer. You want to make sure you don't uh, shortchange yourself on what you invest in the woofer system because the people who are making some of the best speakers around are allocating a significant part. I'm going to say, just to pick a very broad number, over 50% of the designer's budget is being allocated to the base system. Let me give you an example of two speakers that I really like that illustrate this point. The Wilson Audio Sasha DAW, which is about a $40,000 speaker, uh, beloved by many. Um, and the Wilson Alex V, which is one of the best speakers I've ever heard. The Sasha DAW and the Alex V have very similar mid-range and tweeter setups. What differs is from the mid-range down, I'm going to call that the base system, although it goes higher than what we would ordinarily think of as base. What differs between the Alex V at 140,000 and the Sasha at 40,000 is mainly, not completely, but mainly the woofer system. Yes, if you look at our Wilson Audio Factory Tour, you will see that the bigger speakers get fancier crossovers and there are other things that go into the recipe. But the point I'm trying to make is very broadly, a lot of money is being spent on woofer systems. So if you go into this and say, well, let me spend $2,000 or $3,000 or $4,000 on the satellites, and then I'll spend $500 or $1,000 on the woofer system, you might be shortchanging yourself. So I say this just to 
uh, make it a consideration for you that you think about almost reversing that and spending as much or more money on the woofer system than you do on the satellite and satellite system itself. Uh, I'm not saying that's better. I'm not saying it's automatically the right answer. I just want to make sure you consider that because especially as you get very good satellites, improving that part of the system may be hard and improving the base part of the system where a lot of money needs to be spent on cabinetry and magnets and drivers and you just need sheer numbers. You know, I would say, I don't know if this is true to say that it's the optimal, but most of the research would suggest that the best woofer system is a four woofer system. I don't mean four woofers in a tower, four woofers spread around the room in very specific points. We'll come back to that in later episodes. The woofer system is just naturally capable of being more expensive, so I want to make sure you can consider that. Okay, enough about that. You get the idea. So that's, that's part A that I want to talk about. Part B that I want to talk about that the Force Field 30 really brings up is it is really nice to have a woofer system that is good enough to be modular. I referred a minute ago to the fact that using multiple woofers is probably the right answer. So when you're shopping for a woofer system, you want to consider, would I be happy with this if I added a second one? Because that's a way to reduce the interaction with the room. Um, but as I'm spending more money, am I going to really regret that this is the right answer? I think with a force field 30, you probably wouldn't. Again, barring the people who want subterranean base. So one of the things I liked about the Force Field 30 was I think it's got the potential to add a second woofer, but a limitation of the Force Field 30, which I'll mention right now, is it does not have a phase adjustment. So since there's no phase control, there are some limitations to how you're going to dial it in and you might find the right placement in the room, for example, but you might want to tweak the phase, and the only way really that I can think of to tweak the phase on the Force Field 30 is by moving it, and that might change the output and so on. If you're gonna stick on a budget, it's great. If you're considering this as a first step in building a very high quality base system, I think you might wanna look for a woofer that's got a phase control. The third element I'll mention here is that I think DSP in the subwoofer can have advantages. We're going to experiment with that down the road in a subsequent review, but you should just know this is a subwoofer that does not have a DSP room correction built into it. One of the things I like about satellite subsystems is you can run the satellites fully, I'm going to call it analog, of course most of us are using digital signals, but analog, let's say pre-amplifier, analog amplifier straight into the speakers, while the DSP room correction is purely on the woofer element. That is another thing you don't get in the Force Field 30. Again, it's <laughs> I don't still don't know how they do it for eight hundred dollars. So you're not, of course, you're not going to have everything. But if you're thinking about this as the first step to kind of a, within your price range, relatively ultimate woofer system, this has the drawback of not having DSP built into the woofer system. And I think it's a great place to do it. You don't have the DSP theoretically, maybe I don't know, interfering with the purity of the mid-range and high frequencies while getting the benefits of the kind of control over room modes that you can really only do with DSP. We can move these things around all we want and play with level and crossover and we aren't even close to the level of correction. The, the tightness within frequency bands and the feedback based uh, control that we can do with DSP. I'll report on whether people are executing DSP in a way that you hear the advantage and go, I want that, but you should know right now that the Force Field 30 is not a DSP-based sub. Okay, as I hope you can tell, 
I really enjoyed my time with uh, Golden Ear Force Field 30. For $800, I think it does a very good job. Uh, I think it does a very good job for the people who are likely to be shopping for a woofer in this price range in that it's relatively compact, so fits pretty well in small rooms, and I thought it was pretty easy to set up. It didn't have a million controls that were confusing. It didn't take me that long to get it dialed in to where I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was an advantage over just the satellites alone. And as I've said ad infinitum, I really liked the satellites that I used with this, so being able to blend with a really good satellite is uh, it's an arduous test, and I think the force field 30 passed. I highly recommend you take a look at it, as well as uh, the other Golden Ear woofers. Uh, this is kind of the baby of the line, and I think you'll be pleased with what you find. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, I would encourage you, I would uh, request, if you would, uh, please subscribe to the channel. It allows more of our reviews and show reports and interviews with industry luminaries and factory tours and product previews and audio basics to show up in your feed. And I think you'll enjoy those. I hope you'll enjoy those. Um, please click on the notification button. Uh, that allows you to get notified, not just see them when you go to your YouTube feed. Um, and of course, visit us on, on hifiplus.com. Check out the magazines. We are trying to cover you uh, in your audio interests in as many ways as we can and do the highest quality job possible. So thanks for watching. We really appreciate it.